Hello everybody and welcome to our video today. For those of you who have been following the channel, goodness golly, we apologize. It has been a long hiatus since we have posted. We appreciate you sticking around. Those new to the channel, uh, welcome. Thanks for checking out the video. Definitely check out our page and other videos. We're hoping to start posting more regularly again after what has been a much longer than anticipated hiatus. So with no further ado, today we are going to dive into respiratory viral season. Goodness knows it is the winter. Everybody watching this video either has had or knows someone that has had the sniffles or cough, congestion, maybe even someone diagnosed with COVID or flu or RSV. So in this video, we're going to go through where the country is at with COVID numbers, where hotspots are, where cases are high, low, hospitalizations, all that kind of stuff. Also talk about the variant circulating, whether it's more severe, less severe, symptoms to look out for, etc. We'll then dive into flu, talk about which types of flu are circulating, the vaccine predicted coverage of preventing the variants that are circulating, and finally we'll end with a RSV, respiratory syncytial virus. These are kind of three of the main viruses circulating around this winter as they tend to do every winter. So with no further ado, quick 30 second break for the introduction, but stick around and we will dive right in. Hello everyone and welcome to another video here at Whiteboard Doctor. Thanks for joining us today. Here at Whiteboard Doctor, our mission is to provide you with free, interesting, relevant, understandable medical education and news for all types of lifelong learners, trainees, and practitioners. We have weekly videos that we debut Fridays at 5 p.m. Eastern Time with bonus medical education videos posted throughout the week. We'd love for you to join the Whiteboard Doctor community and follow along by hitting the subscribe button located in the bottom right-hand corner. We also encourage all likes and comments, even if it is just to say hello. All our video descriptions contain links for additional related videos that might be interesting, so don't forget to check those out. And lastly, a quick disclaimer, none of these videos are intended to be acted upon as medical advice. Please pause the video here and read this disclaimer its entirety before moving on. With no further ado, stay well, keep learning, and let's get to the video. All right, thanks for sticking around. So with no further ado, COVID-19, the gift that keeps on giving, it seems like, might just be part of our circulating kind of winter viruses from here on out. But nonetheless, something interesting to talk about. So this data is from the CDC, the Centers for Disease Control. Shout out to them. Thanks for bringing us data in a way we can understand. And this first map here is the percent positivity of COVID-19 nucleic acid amplification tests abbreviated NATS, just in the past week by HHS, uh, bro broken down by region to make it easier to understand. And what we can see is down here we have the percents, right, of case changes. Green is less than 5%, kind of this lighter green is 5 to 9.9% increase, 10 to 15% increase, 15 to 20% increase, and greater than 20% increase. And you can see different regions are currently seeing a different level of percent positivity. So of all the tests taken, this is going to tell us the positive tests as divided by all the tests taken. So the percent of tests that are positive, when that percent starts to go up, it suggests that there is a higher burden of disease or of positive tests in that region. And you see the biggest hotspot on this map would be this region here, right? Kind of the Midwest. Minnesota, Wisconsin, Illinois, Michigan, Indiana, Ohio. Um, all these countries are seeing what seems to be about a 15 to 20% increase in percent positive COVID-19 cases over the last week. And that would suggest this is probably gonna keep going up, right? We're still coming off the holidays a little bit. Oftentimes, test positivity lags behind when the disease or the virus has actually been spread, right? Because you have to catch it. Then it incubates in your body for a couple of days without symptoms. Then you develop some symptoms and usually takes you a day or two before you'll test yourself. And then it comes back positive. So this might still go up in this region and other regions, but it seems like the Midwest here is the area that's seeing the highest burden of positive COVID-19 tests out of all these different areas. You can see the other hot spots are gonna be the Pacific Northwest here and the Northeast, and that's about a 10 to 15% increase in percent positive cases over the past week. The rest of the area kind of north central, west, southwest, southeast, and south are all pretty low. They're all between this five to 10%, um, but all this would suggest there is an increase 
in percent positivity in all places throughout the U.S., right? Nothing is this dark green. They're all this turquoise color into yellow orange. There also doesn't seem to be, unless I'm colorblind, any cases that are greater than 20%. This orange color here, I think, is the 15 to 19.9% .9 rather than the 20%, although it'd be nice if these colors were a little bit uh, more different. So COVID cases are increasing, as is expected in the winter when other respiratory viral illnesses increase. So nothing surprising here. This isn't a suggestion that there's another big COVID spike other than what would be expected, but it is an indication that COVID, just like flu and RSV and these other viruses that seem to spread more in the winter, most likely is going to spread more in the winter. The secondary question here is, are there more hospitalizations in these areas? And this is a chart done here again by the CDC. And before we keep scrolling down, what this graph is showing us is COVID-19 hospital admission levels in U.S. by county. And again, anytime you see hospital admission levels, you wonder, are they admitted because of COVID or are they admitted for something else and tested positive for COVID? This is theoretically admissions because of COVID, although there's imperfections to the way data is gathered uh, based on the medical record and how things are entered. But theoretically, this is admissions because of COVID infection. And you can see here, again, the orange color is greater than 20% increase in new COVID-19 admissions to the hospital. Yellow is 10 to 20%, green is less than 10%. If we scroll down, you can see that we have some, you, this is by county, so everyone watching this video who lives in the U.S. might be able to see what county they're in and where case counts are. And this pattern, it does seem to follow where cases are uh, increasing the highest, kind of this northeast quadrant the Midwest quadrant, and then the Pacific Northwest don't see as much increase in hospitalizations there as some of these other places. The hottest spots are going to be these orange colors. So you can see there's some kind of hot spots scattered throughout. Interestingly, the Midwest doesn't have a ton of orange, although it certainly has more yellow. And remember, the yellow was that 10 to 15 percent, I believe, increase. Yeah, 10 to 20% increase in new hospitalizations. So the Midwest is seeing a lot of that degree of increase in hospitalizations, although not a lot of the orange, which is that greater than 20%. When it comes to deaths from COVID-19, I did just add, this is the CDC's uh, graphic on new deaths, and there does seem to be a 12.5% increase in deaths in the most recent weeks. Now, if we digest this information again with just in mind that we're in respiratory viral season, it's the winter. I'm not incredibly surprised by these numbers. Certainly, it is sad, terrible that COVID-19 is still making people sick, making people sick enough to need hospitalization, and making people sick enough in the hospital that they might die from it. And we're going to see more people die from COVID-19. But it does seem like COVID is behaving somewhat like a lot of the other respiratory viral illnesses. We don't talk about it as much, but influenza, as we'll talk about uh, down below, also causes hospitalizations and also causes deaths. So still something that should be prevented, still something you should think about vaccination for, still something you should be cautious of, especially if you have medical conditions or you're immunosuppressed or you're you know very, very um, old or very, very young, so are elderly and are young populations. Um, all should be cognizant of the fact COVID is spreading and can cause hospitalization and death, but it's not to a degree where we are worried that there's another big COVID surge beyond what might be expected in the winter. The variant circulating, just wanted to shout this out a little bit. Uh, this is a graphic here. This is the variant percentage in the United States of COVID-19. And as you can see, the variant spreading now is this J, oops, JN1. And JN1 is this purple amount here. And this graph is percent viral lineages among infections. So of those that test positive for COVID and get their COVID sequenced, uh, which is not something you actively do as a person, but something these labs do, they send a certain percentage of their positive tests to get sequenced. You can see that this JN1 variant has been increasing each week. And it's predicted on January 6th to represent um, almost 60% of all COVID positive cases. JN1 is part of the Omicron family, 
of COVID-19 viruses, although it has a lot of differences from Omicron, the good news is when it's actually been studied in an objective manner, it does not seem, I'll just write it here, does not seem to cause more severe disease. It does not seem to cause a higher incidence of hospitalizations. Um, and the symptoms are similar to previous Omicron variants, headache, cough, congestion, sore throat. Some people might get fevers. Um, so it does not seem to be much different than previous Omicron variants, causing the same degree of illness, which for some people can be very, very severe. Um, you know, I work uh, in the intensive care unit as part, as part of my job, and I've seen people admitted very, very sick with COVID-19 in the intensive care unit. Um, so you can get sick from it, and those at risk should be cognizant of that, but it does not seem to be making people more sick than previous variants had, which is good news. Um, as, as these variants mutate, we always got to keep an eye and make sure that a variant doesn't pop up that does cause people to get more sick. All right, moving on. Influenza, another gift that every season keeps on giving. So flu cases are uh, going up a lot. I'm seeing it a lot in the hospital. I also work in the emergency department. We're seeing a lot of flu cases. And this is flu positivity. So what you can see here is you have number of positive specimens. And then this is time by week. And I don't know why they like to write it this way, but this is essentially week 52, which I think is December 26th through January 1st, is this graphic here. And you can see that over the past couple of weeks, cases have been uh, skyrocketing. They do seem to have plateaued over the past two weeks uh, to about 18% of all tests are positive. So one in five flu tests are positive uh, and to about 18 to 20,000 cases a week. You can see here that most of these cases are this yellow bar, which is flu A. So most people are catching flu A. Green is flu B and flu B is increasing as well right green here is flu B but flu A is the one that is dominating most of the cases and when they break down flu A this is a graph here uh, table on flu A subtypes right just like COVID has variants influenza or flu has variants and flu A is you can it's a little different but you can kind of think of flu A as the umbrella term like Omicron and then within flu A there are sub variants as well and the one that is dominating causing, I know this is small, so I'm going to read it out loud, 87.7% .7 of new flu cases is this H1N1 PDM9. And the reason I'm pointing this out is because when we think about flu vaccine, what we do each year is we essentially guess which sub-variants of flu are going to be circulating, and then we make a vaccine that will prevent the guessed upon variants, right? Because to make a vaccine, it takes a lot of time to make it, produce it, uh, get it to different places and give it to people. So you can't come, you know, November, be like, oh, this is the flu that's circulating. Let's make a vaccine ag uh, against it and then try to get that vaccine out to everyone. Because by the time you got it done, it would be spring and flu season would be over. So they essentially will guess based on data and what has circulated where what variants will be circulating in the United States, make a vaccine to prevent that, and then distribute it to people. But then you also have to check, was that the right educated guess? Did they choose the right subvariants of flu to vaccinate against? And this PDM9, they look at, so flu in the Southern Hemisphere, right? United States is in the Northern Hemisphere. In the Southern Hemisphere, flu circulates months and months earlier. And a lot of times the flu variants circulating in the Southern Hemisphere are the flu variants that are going to come and circulate in the Northern Hemisphere in our winter. And when they studied whether the vaccine was effective against some of the variants in the Southern Hemisphere, it was effective against this PDM9 H1N1 variant. And what that implies is the vaccine that was distributed in the United States that does seem to be effective against this PDM9 variant should be effective against the PDM9 variant in the United States that's currently circulating, right? So they said, hey, everybody, we made a vaccine. Part of that vaccine prevention is against PDM9. And lo and behold, look at that. PDM9 is the 
major subvariant of flu circulating in the U.S., so that vaccine should have a good degree of efficacy. And in South America, I think it was around 55 or 60 percent effective in preventing hospitalizations, which is pretty solid for flu. That's not that's not bad at all. Um, on average, I think usually it's 40 to 60 percent effective. So flu vaccine does seem to be effective, at least against the dominant flu variant that's circulating in the United States right now um, in terms of prevention hospitalizations. Last but certainly not least, the respiratory syncytial virus. This is like, uh, I feel like flu and COVID's less talked about, you know, I guess uh, cousin or something. So respiratory syncytial virus is abbreviated RSV. We think about it a lot more in young kids. It can make young kids really, really sick. Anyone who is a parent who has had a kid with RSV, uh, unfortunately might have seen them get very sick where they have to go on extra levels of oxygen and be admitted to the intensive care unit. They get really congested, their blood oxygen levels drop. Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. But we're starting to see RSV make elderly individuals also quite sick, and I've seen a few older folks who have been sick in the hospital with RSV um, who have needed high levels of oxygen. The CDC data on RSV is not re nearly as robust. You can see this is one of the few graphs that they post uh, on their website, and this is December thirtieth, twenty twenty three. So twelve thirty, twenty twenty three, and what it is showing is that starting back in this is September of 2023 there's this huge increase in RSV cases since September and now we've plateaued a little bit here which is nice so RSV seems to have taken off and started kind of mid late fall caused a ton of illness and hopefully we've plateaued it'd be great to see RSV start coming back down there's still plenty of winter left so it's tough to say but this data would suggest that maybe we'll see RSV cases going back down. I'm just gonna pull up my browser because they do give you a little more information. This is the CDC website, the National Respiratory and Enteric Virus Surveillance System. And if I go back here, you can do it by region, break the data down by region here. And what you'll see is if I just scroll down, um, some regions are starting to see a decrease in cases, right? This is kind of the Boston area, decrease in cases. See this graph, the red line, decrease in cases, big decrease in cases. So a lot of these subregions are starting to see a decrease in cases. And this kind of one looks like it's a, about plateauing. This one's coming way down. So all this should hopefully imply that most areas will have uh, a plateau or decrease in their RSV cases, which just leaves us flu and COVID that we're uh, still dealing with. But we'll keep a close eye on that too. Also, flu variants can sometimes change the ones that are circulating. So there's always a chance that the major one right now, this PDM9, which the vaccine does seem to be effective against, might stop being the dominant variant and might instead the dominant variant change to something else, which the vaccine may or may not be super effective against. So that's something we'll keep an eye on too. We appreciate you checking out the video. Uh, this was just kind of a video to get our our uh, feet back, back in the game here, and uh, we'll hopefully be coming out with more videos as time goes on. Let us know what thoughts, questions, comments you have down below. Subscribe, hit the bell button, check out our other videos. We certainly appreciate you all, uh, and thanks for sticking with us. We will see you all next time. Stay well.